Pushkin. Man, it was great to be a teenager in the 80s. There was hair metal, new wave, and rap. Die Hard, Ferris Bueller, and Elf. And there was no shortage of gods to pray to. One year, I had these three posters on my bedroom walls. One for Eric B. and Rakim's landmark debut, Paid in Full. One for the Lancia Stratos rally car. And one of the Max L. tape guy in the armchair, getting his hair blown back by the sweet jams coming out of his speakers. It was a glorious time. All those posters were aspirational. Thankfully, for everyone's sake, I would never be a rapper. I'd never own a Stratos. And my stereo system was a yellow, waterproof Sony Walkman. All those things on the posters? Out of reach. What did seem reasonable, and what I thought I could maybe get my parents to buy me, or possibly even buy myself, was a couple-year-old Volkswagen GTI. The GTI was our attainable icon. The car every Mountain Dew swilling, Dracar gift box receiving, Jansport toting, suburban teenager wanted. It wasn't overtly sporty like a Camaro or a Mustang, but those were unrealistically expensive to insure. Besides, they were parental kryptonite. No right-thinking adult would let their kid drive a stoplight dragster like a Camaro. Based on the workaday VW Golf, the GTI was under the radar. It didn't look like a sports car because it had a hatchback. It didn't have sports car power either, just a little more than 100 horses. But the GTI was fast because it was light, about 2,000 pounds when a Camaro weighed a good 50% more. So yeah, it didn't look like a sports car, but it definitely looked cool. Upright and angular, it was Echo and the Bunnymen to the Camaro's Bachman-Turner Overdrive. It had blacked out wheels and a thin red frame for the grill. You could get your stuff in it. You could get your friends in it. You could get your friends' stuff in it. In more than just its space efficiency, the GTI was a Trojan horse. Where most people saw a small economy car, the clued up car kid saw an Autobahn cruiser in miniature. To drive the GTI was to fold into the slipstream of those European performance car heroes like the AMG Hammer or the BMW M6. Pair of dark Serengetis on your face, pack of red Dunhills in the center console, living Euro style. The GTI was a Gen X icon. For proof, look no further than its leading thinker, Malcolm Gladwell. Gladwell is an avowed GTI man. He sums up the car's essence concisely. It's like it spoils you for other cars, like having owned them for so long. My expectation of what a car should be able to do, be a daily driver, be insanely fun to drive, have a lot of room in it, not be that expensive, get good gas mileage, all in one package. And every other car like fails on one of those counts. I'm Eddie Alterman and this is Car Show, my podcast about why we drive what we drive. In this episode, we'll talk about how VW's GTI was a radically different kind of performance car for a new generation of car enthusiasts with absolutely zero precedent but also, conversely, that it was almost exactly like the definitive American muscle car, the Pontiac GTO. This is the untold story of how the GTI is Generation X's GTO. Malcolm and I are at the wheel of a 2022 Volkswagen GTI 
now in its eighth generation. Over the years, Malcolm has owned several GTIs and its even more powerful sibling, the Golf R. A quick note before we go any further. The VW hatchback comes in three flavors, ascending in intensity. The mild yet wild Golf, the flaming hot GTI, and the ghost pepper scorcher, the Golf R. But the GTI is the sweet spot, the original hot hatch. Malcolm got hooked on these VW hatchbacks when he moved to New York City, trading his Lexus sports sedan for something more practical and parkable. And so I got a GTI. I had two GTIs and I had R's ever since. And, you know, once you start, there's no going back. There's a great uh, scene in that Netflix um, Drive to Survive special where Carlos signs. He was driving for McLaren at the time. And uh, he said, you know, everybody asks me, what do you drive? What McLaren do you drive? He goes, I drive a Golf. <laughs> nice. The GTI reimagined the performance car along rational lines rather than emotional ones. Before the little fuel efficient, space efficient, and mass efficient VW, performance cars were either burbling sleds from Detroit with big V8s up front and smoking rear tires, or they were swoopy European coupes like Porsches and Ferraris with lofty price tags and equally lofty top speeds. The seeds of the GTI lie in both. Like those European coupes, it was built to cover alpine roads at terrifying speeds. But believe it or not, its stronger kinship is to the flatlands of Detroit. The GTI took a boxy and conservative car, the Golf, and shot it full of performance-enhancing drugs. This is the pattern by which most Detroit muscle came to be, most notably the Pontiac GTO. The GTO started as a mid-sized two-door family sedan, ambitiously badged the Tempest, but it was no force of nature. Mild as mayo, the Tempest was built for pipe-smoking, aero-shirt-wearing insurance salesmen. But subversive elements within Pontiac conspired to turn this humble commuter box into the definitive muscle car, and not via any official approved route. Something uncannily similar happened with the GTI. They've stopped making GTOs. Pontiacs, too. But the GTI is now eight generations old and counting, and it still feels daring and subversive. The funny thing is, Volkswagen arrived at this perfectly attuned, entirely new kind of performance car almost by accident. But before we get to how the GTI changed the world, we have to talk about the car on which it is based, the VW Golf. The Golf was built to usurp the aging Volkswagen Beetle. The Beetle was sort of the car Germans were issued at birth. It basically came with a pair of lederhosen in the trunk and a jar of stewed cabbage in the glove box. But by the 1970s, it really needed replacing. The Beetle was commissioned by Hitler, and in post-war Germany, it began to carry the stench of it. Plus, it was old. The first Beatles came out in 1938. By the 1960s, America seemed to like the Beetle more than Germany did. Sales of the Beetle in America almost doubled in the mid-60s, from over 200,000 in 1963 to around 400,000 just five years later. Credit the hippie ascendancy. To me, this has always been a hilarious irony of the Beetle in America. Hitler's car somehow became our symbol of peace and love. Part of this rebranding was due to compelling advertising that positioned the Beetle as the smaller, smarter antidote to the land yachts pumped out by Detroit's factories. Ever wish your car didn't guzzle so much gas? The Volkswagen cuts most gas bills in half. Ever wish you owned a Volkswagen? But some of it was due to how cheap and easy the thing was to own and maintain. To the unshowered anti-capitalist, the Beetle was better than an ounce of Oaxacan gold. But as you might imagine, displacing the long-running Beetle was a high-stakes affair. So, like any panicking carmaker, 
VW turned to the maestro, designer Giorgetto Giugiaro, to fix the problem. Giugiaro, an elegant and brilliant Italian, understood automotive beauty in his bones. He came from a family of fresco painters and designed a string of great Alfa Romeos, Ferraris, and Maseratis. He knew proportion and aesthetics almost genetically, but he also understood that a car's design had to work. It had to fit people comfortably. They needed to be able to see out of it. They needed somewhere to put their luggage. It wasn't all about superficial beauty. The true beauty was in the way it functioned. And what Jujaro turned out was so deceptively simple that only a genius could have created it. Engine in the front, hatchback in the rear, with straightforward, sharply creased bodywork. This thing of beauty, the precursor to the GTI, was the Golf. We used to do this thing, all of my Canadian cousins, and my Long Island cousins, and my brother would come visit me up here and we would gather all the sporting cars we had and we would have a Capero, like a family Capero. <laughs> really? And so we would have my cousin's 911, the whatever the 2000 and early aughts one was. We had a second generation or a third generation Miata. We had my M5, I've had a Boxster back then my R, my brother's CTS-4, and, you know, we'd drive for a couple hours and just change cars constantly. And then we would all kind of do a little, fill out a little subjective questionnaire. <laughs> I and love your family really We do it every year. <laughs> but the R, if you, to those who had never driven the R before, the R was always this revelation. They were always like, wait, what? That's what that car is? You know, no one could believe it. It's like it can cover ground faster than almost anything because there's no waste. It's like all of the performance in this vehicle is usable. There's nothing excessive about it. It's yeah. all like kind of perfectly keyed to the to every situation. I don't know how they do it other than to, other than you know just constant evolution of a, of a very good original idea. I mean, you never feel like you're out of control. You never feel like it's too fast or too slow. It's just always sort of perfectly, yeah. you know, sighted. For a while, the Golf was known in America as the Rabbit, extending the Beatles' wildlife theme. The car's appearance told you what it did, and it was indeed a bit rabbit-like, ready to hop on the road. Canted forward with acres of glass, the Rabbit slash Golf was a bright and modern replacement for the German everyman's car. It was comfortable to be in and had tons of cargo room inside. It was a triumph of styling and design. All of this combined to make the car an instant hit, a new car for a new Germany. Giugiaro called it the most important design of his career. And like the little anti-hippie I was at the time, I thought this anti-Beetle would make the perfect statement about who I was as a high school junior. Function perfectly fused to form. That's what I wanted to convey to any prospective romantic partner. Alas, my message was lost. Fast forward to today. As I'm driving around the Hudson Valley in a brand new GTI, I'm telling our producer Sam about the first one I ever owned. You were saying inside that you really wanted a Golf when you were a kid. Yeah, so I always thought VWs were super cool cars. And um, when I was a wee pup and um, my parents were uh, generous enough to buy me a car, um, they didn't really understand why I was so passionate about the golf and why the golf was so important for my sense of self. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I remember going car shopping with my dad and he was like, how about the Chevy Beretta? And, you know, being the ingrate that I was, I was like, no, dad, the golf is super cool. You got to drive them both. And uh, so we drove the Beretta and I really didn't love, you know, 
the way it responded. I didn't like the brake feel. I was a little car snob at the time, and uh, still am. <laughs> and I didn't feel real comfortable in the car. And uh, my friend had a Golf that I had driven a bunch, and I really loved it, and I felt really at ease in the vehicle, really at home. And I sold my dad on this idea that I'm going to be a safer driver <laughs> in the Golf than I will be in the Beretta. Uh, even though the Beretta was a little bit cheaper. When he drove the Golf, my dad's a car guy too, he's like, oh, I see exactly what you're talking about. This is a way better car. My dad used to sell cars in Detroit when he was 19 years old. He knows what's good. And he was really impressed with how much space there was in it, how predictable the steering and braking felt, and how easy it was to see out of. He saw that the fundamentals were right, and they needed to be. The Golf lineup was overbuilt for suburban kid duty. Even the basic Golf was engineered to keep up in the unlimited speed environment of the German Autobahn. The predictability and fidelity of all the controls, the steering, the braking, the shifter, were there to give the driver confidence at high speed. Because you don't want surprises at 100 miles an hour. You want an overabundance of competence and efficiency of movement yours and the cars. That's what the Golf always represented to me. It was sort of a thinking man's economy car. And um, I think it still is. I think it, that's one of those things that's really persisted. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of economy cars come and go, but the Golf is pretty resolute, GTI especially. And uh, you, you know, driving this one, you still really feel all those great values. If you were to um shut your eyes metaphorically not literally since yes. we're <laughs> driving um can you still see and feel and put yourself in in your first golf yeah i and this one brings back a lot of memories you know there's a, a certain family resemblance in the way that the steering feels the way the car rides the way you sit in it the way you look out of it the driving position is still so so good and it's really just still a driver's car, and you feel those sort of echoes of the past in this one. As the Golf and GTI have aged, their capabilities have expanded in every dimension. They've become faster, yet more fuel efficient. Tidier handling, yet with more space inside. It's a paradox of a machine and a paragon of evolution. The car Jujaro drew was right from the start, because it was an expression of the car's purpose. That's why it has lasted. It was a new kind of family car, with a radical repackaging of the family and cargo inside. It wasn't a typical two-door or four-door with trunk design. It had a new form and carried a new modern message. Now, you might find it weird that I keep referring to the Golf as a family car, because it isn't one in America. In Germany, though, it's a totally different story. As I told Malcolm, I remember having this meeting in a corporate boardroom at, at VW with uh, the chairman of the company, Herr Dr. Ferdinand Pieck, who was the chairman of the company. Oh, with Peach. Yes. The great Peach. Oh, the best car guy of all time, also the most ruthless and demonic of all car executives. So, so this so steely-eyed, you know, basically, you know, Uber Group and Führer guy, um, he gets us all together in this corporate boardroom with all of his lieutenants, and he makes this very short speech. And he says, in the future, VW will compete with Mercedes and Audi will compete with BMW. And we're like, yeah, okay, that, okay, I get the Audi thing, that tracks, but VW with Mercedes? Are you, got, are you out of your friggin' mind? Like, what are you talking about? The VW in the US is the countercultural car. Yeah. It's the Beetle, it's not. And, and it occurred to, I think, a lot of us, like, he's talking about the German conception of what VW is. And in Germany, this is the family car. This is the Ur family car. This yeah. is like the Camry. 
this is like a Malibu or something. And so, of course, he would say, well, why can't we take our Camry and turn it into a Lexus? We can do that. It's just the same car in two different contexts with two different meanings. Well, our, for us, a small, light, tossable, to use a, a automobile writer's favorite phase, <laughs> phrase, a car is a novelty. Yes. To them, it's commonplace. So that's the distinction. Like, It's like the concept of terroir. Right? They have the Alps that run across all of their countries. Yeah. We have vertical mountains not running through much of America. So, you know, the guys in Detroit who are developing sporty cars like Camaros and Mustangs were doing it within the context of straight line speed. Yeah. Not roads like this. Not these curvy, beautiful, off-camber, you know mountainous roads and you can tell a lot about a car company based on where it's based the original proving grounds at General Motors was a road like pretty much a straight road oh really? <laughs> yeah. that's hilarious until Bob Lutz built the well they're in road Detroit, course. they're in Michigan I mean it's like that's what you guys have right, it's pretty flat when we come back We'll talk about how this family car morphed into Germany's version of the American muscle car. I'm Eddie Alterman, and this is Car Show. The Golf gave Germany its new family car, something far more advanced than the World War II era Beetle. But that first-generation Golf was kind of slow, and there was political resistance to making it faster. Here's why. In 1973, VW unveiled a performance version of the Beetle meant to stoke sales. They called it the GSR, or Gelb Schwarzer Renner, which means yellow-black racer. It had yellow and black paint, front disc brakes, and a terrifying 50 horsepower. 50. It caused a great stir among the hat-wearing burgers of northern Deutschland. It was so scandalous, all this performance, that the GSR caught the attention of the German parliament, which denounced it as a menace, an invitation to drive like a maniac. In the wake of all this, VW is gun-shy about adding more juice to the Golf. Kind of funny now, when Germany is making 600-horsepower super sedans, but there you have it. The work to boost the Golf would have to be done in secret. A small group of VW engineers and PR men took the fuel-injected, 110-horsepower engine from the Audi 80 GTE and dropped it into the Golf. They also dressed up the interior, with tartan plaid seats and a dimpled shift knob, like a golf ball. They called it the GTI for Gran Turismo Iniezione, or Grand Tour Injection, a reference to the fuel-injected Audi engine. Proving that Germans do have a sense of humor, GTI was also a reference to the great and beautiful Ferrari GTO, the swoopiest, sexiest European racing car ever made. GTO stood for Gran Turismo Homologato, which means basically a race car that was slightly adapted to be road legal. VW unveiled the GTI at the 1975 International Motor Show in Frankfurt. They hoped to sell 5,000 of the things. They eventually made more than 450,000, and that's just the first generation car. This new, faster, dressed up Golf was a certified hit. So much so that the letters GTI became shorthand for any kind of performance hatchback. Peugeot, Opel, even Suzuki drafted onto the popularity of the VW model with GTIs of their own. The hot hatch segment it birthed is still going strong. The eighth generation car Malcolm and I are driving competes with cars from Honda, Hyundai, Toyota, you name it. 
Gen Xers gravitated toward these cars because they were affordable, approachable, and low-key fun. They defined performance as something other than just pure horsepower. They were about handling, steering, braking, you know, stuff American performance cars couldn't do at the time. And stylistically, they were the complete opposite of those American silverbacks. They were rational and usable. Hatchbacks instead of trunks. Four cylinders instead of eight. Front wheel drive instead of rear drive. These were cars of the Reagan era. They just said no to drugs. Junior Republicans and yuppies in training bought them in order to make themselves seem more interesting. Alex P. Keaton would have driven one of these on his way up to a BMW 325. Even those of us with no political affiliation thought salvation lay in those tartan plaid seats. We wanted something different out of our performance cars than our parents did. We wanted smart performance rather than just brute, tire-roasting force. Did you want a GTI when you were getting yours? Oh, I wanted a GTI so badly. There was a generational shift that the GTI captured in terms of what a performance car looked like, what it handled like, what it could be. It was not going to bite you in the same way that a, that a <laughs> 32 Ford hot rod would, <laughs> or, you know, a crazy souped up muscle car. You know, those cars were just um, really chaotic. <laughs> <laughs> this one's not. This one's tight and trim and very orderly, and it's like, you know, this is not a classic rock car. This is a new wave car. <laughs> this is a synth car. This is not, you know, this is not. Hendrix at Monterey. This is Depeche Mode at right. uh, Glastonbury. <laughs> <laughs> but what if one day you were reading Rolling Stone or Mojo and found out that Depeche Mode claimed that its biggest influence, both melodically and harmonically, was Jimi Hendrix? Would your mind be blown? It's not true, by the way. Just trying to make a point. But that's sort of what's happening here. And here is where my argument steps out on a tightrope. For though the GTI was a new kind of performance car, it was also, the more you look at it, akin to an old kind of performance car, the original muscle car, the Pontiac GTO we talked about earlier. But before we get to how the GTI is both like and unlike the original muscle car, we must define our terms. What's a muscle car anyway? This question lands, like so many before it, on the doorstep of one John Z. DeLorean. You know his eponymous car from Back to the Future. Doc! Marty! You made it! Yeah! Welcome to my latest experiment. This is the big one, the one I've been waiting for all my life. Ah, uh, well, it's a DeLorean, right? Bear with what me, Marty. All it? your questions will be answered. Roll yeah. tape. Okay, I will proceed. Uh, Before DeLorean became famous for his silvery go-wing sports car and the cocaine deal gone bad meant to fund it, he was the boy wonder of Detroit. A child of Romanian and Hungarian immigrants, he was the youngest person ever to run a GM division. He became Pontiac's boss when he was just 40. He was his generation's Mark Zuckerberg, a world mover. And like Zuck, he looked like the wimpiest officer in the Roman Legion. He got to the top of Pontiac because he was a risk taker and a great engineer. More specifically, he got to the top of Pontiac because he created the GTO. Back when DeLorean was merely Pontiac's chief engineer, in the 60s, General Motors had what they called a racing ban. It meant that, for the sake of good corporate citizenship, no division would campaign racing cars. As part of this de-emphasis of performance, GM set strict rules about what size engine could go into which size road car. Could Pontiac just put its biggest V8 in its mid-sized Tempest? No, the biggest engine was for the biggest cars, the Bonneville and the Catalina. DeLorean didn't really give a shit what the rules were. With Pontiac and the rest of GM out of racing, he was going to build Pontiac's reputation by building performance cars for the street. GM restrictions said that the biggest engine that could go into a mid-sized car like the Tempest 
was the 5.4 liter V8. But DeLorean circumvented this rule by making the big 6.4 liter engine from the Catalina and the Bonneville an option on the order sheet rather than a whole separate car. He made it possible for customers to make their own V8 powered monster sedan. Order code number 382. He called it the Pontiac Tempest Le Mans GTO. Midsize family car. Clandestine project. Big engine. Any of this sounding familiar? The Pontiac was not certified for racing, not officially anyway, but it was an outlaw drag racer on Detroit streets like Gratiot and Woodward Avenues. With his GTO, DeLorean made his intentions and pretensions clear. Though a few pedants might say that the first muscle car was something like the Oldsmobile Rocket 88 or the Chrysler 300 from the 50s, I wouldn't. The muscle car was a movement, a cultural phenomenon. The GTO is generally considered the first of them because it launched a category that still means turnkey, affordable, American performance. In its first year, 1964, Pontiac sold nearly 35,000 of them. The next year, 75,000. The year after that, almost 100,000. It was a legitimate sensation. Some sporting cars are only pussycats. Pontiac's GTO is all tiger. Agile, nimble, one of the wide track tigers from Pontiac. GTO. It's also fair to say that it gave an outlet for the pent up frustrations of a newly liberated generation. The muscle car was the male expression of the sexual revolution. When women were burning bras, men were buying Pontiacs. Built for power and straight line speed, the GTO broke the dam. It meant an unshackling of primal urges. Burbling V8 exhaust notes were mating calls. Tire smoke would roast the marshmallow men. No longer would young Turks have to shave their faces and cut their hair short. No more skinny ties and brill cream. They could walk around in sheepskin denim vests and get away with it. In the movie Dazed and Confused, Richard Linklater captures this unbridled maleness perfectly in the form of Matthew McConaughey's character, Wooderson. Here's Wooderson outside the Emporium Pool Hall describing the Chevelle he called Melba Toast. Let me tell you what Melba Toast is packing right here. All right, we've got 411 Posi Track out back, 750 double pumper, Edelbrock intakes, board over 30, 11 to 1 pop-up pistons, turbojet, 390 horsepower. We're talking some fucking muscle. Hey, man, I know you got this thing out of a car. Because the GTO Sorry. was so popular, a flurry of ever faster cars followed it. Dodge Chargers and Plymouth Cudas, Oldsmobile 442s and Chevy Chevelles like Wooderson's. All of them chunky two-door sedans with big V8s under the hood and rear-wheel drive out back. Two doors, mid-sized car, V8. That is the muscle car template, and none shall veer from it. Purists broke no deviation from this formula. To hear a muscle car person tell it, a Camaro or a Mustang isn't even a muscle car. It's a pony car, damn it. Get it straight. Too swoopy. Too small. Too equine in name. Neither is anything with four doors a muscle car. That includes even the latest Hellcat-powered Dodge Challenger. This is an orthodoxy worthy of the Crusaders. If you don't believe me, go on the internet sometime and try it. Never in a million years would today's satin-jacketed muscle car faithful ever call the GTI an heir to the Pontiac GTO. The GTO sired the Hemi Cuda, not some puny European runabout. But I invoke the mighty Pontiac GTO here, in this episode on the VW GTI, not just because it's almost the same three letters with the same Ferrari inspiration. It's because they have the same origin story. 
they arose out of almost the exact same clandestine circumstances. And they are based on the same kind of car, not in terms of form, but in terms of function. They were both family cars reimagined as performance machines. And both took off like ornery racehorses. Both had the same segment spawning impact. They tapped into something unexpected, a latent yearning from newly licensed kids. Kids who tweaked them, raced them, and made them legends. So why is any of this important? Because youthful freedom takes many forms, but the spirit is the same. Get out of the house fast. It's going to happen whether anyone likes it or not. Two family cars, two hot engines, two segments created, two generations served. One ocean between them. Yes, indeed, the GTI was our GTO. Car Show is written and hosted by me, Eddie Alterman. It's produced by Sam Dingman, Jacob Smith, and Amy Gaines. Our editor is Jen Guerra. Original music and mastering by Ben Tolliday. Our executive producer is Mia Lobel. Our show art was designed by Sean Carney and airbrushed by Greg Lefevre. Our patron saints are Lital Malad and Justine Lang. Special thanks to the folks of Volkswagen for loaning us the GTI. And extra special thanks to Malcolm Gladwell for riding along. Car Show is a production of Pushkin Industries. If you love this show and others from Pushkin Industries, consider subscribing to Pushkin Plus. Pushkin Plus is a podcast subscription that offers bonus content and uninterrupted listening for just $4.99 a month. Look for Pushkin Plus on Apple Podcast subscriptions. To find more Pushkin podcasts, listen on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts.